I want to big up Joel Fletcher. He's a member of my Facebook boxing group, Hatman Boxing. He made a post saying that Tyson Fury is the most improved heavyweight in the world. And I 100% agree. If you compare Tyson Fury in his early career to the Tyson Fury of today, it's night and day. It's a completely different fighter. In fact, outside of the hardcore Tyson Fury fans, because every fighter, no matter how garbage the fighter is, not, let me not say every fighter, but most fighters, even fighters who are rubbish and never go on to do anything, have got a hardcore little clique of fans who believe in him and support him and swear blind that they're going to be the next best thing since sliced bread. So Tyson Fury had a little hardcore group of fans who are going to believe in him no matter what. But in terms of the neutrals, if you'd seen Tyson Fury early on in his career, you would have had to have been Nostradamus to predict that he would have gone on to beat Klitschko and be as good as he's ended up being. Literally, because Tyson Fury early in his career was struggling with the likes of John McDermott. He looked poor in these fights against McDermott. He looked real poor, struggling. Even in the McDermott rematch, he struggled. Later on in his career, he fought Nevin Pikage. That's Fury on the floor getting decked heavy by Pykage, a guy who only had about five KOs on his record. Then later on, in his American debut as a pro, dropped heavily by career cruiserweight Steve Cunningham. So, you know, for most neutral people, now, now by the time he fought Cunningham, he had shown a lot of talent, to be fair. He boxed Southpaw and switched between Southpaw and Orthodox in several fights. He had that fight against Kevin Johnson where I was really impressed by him. But... A lot of people still weren't sold on Tyson Fury because of things like this. Being dropped heavy on his US debut against Cunningham. Being dropped by Pikage. You know, the two McDermott fights. And remember, when Fury's rival, David Price, came along, Price was destroying the likes of John McDermott. Yeah, Fury went life and death with him twice. Price knocked him out in a round. So the general consensus back then was that David Price is way better than Tyson Fury. I mean, Price is destroying guys who Fury is going life and death with. But this is where styles make fights comes into the equation. I know it's a very overused term, particularly by people like me, but it really is applicable, particularly in the heavyweight division. Heavyweight boxing is notoriously unpredictable. It doesn't seem to make sense. It really is chess it ain't checkers because obviously Tyson Fury was able to turn his career around when he hooked up with his uncle Peter, who got him on the straight and narrow, got him in shape, taught him a lot of boxing fundamentals and the rest is history. But you can look at many other fighters and I have to big up boxing beats and rhymes for this video right here called no excuses in boxing. Excellent video. I recommend all of you to go watch it, but he talks about, the likes of Muhammad Ali. So Muhammad Ali going into the Liston fight, he'd been dropped. Yeah. Was also dropped against Henry Cooper going into the Liston fight. Liston at the time was seen as virtually invincible. So for a guy who's getting dropped by 185 pound Cooper, what chance does he have against Liston? But boxing is chess. It ain't checkers. It's styles make fights. It's rock, paper, scissors. Ali went in there and he beat Liston, beat him in a rematch, and he went on a run for several years as heavyweight champion until the uh, Vietnam draft controversy uh, forced him to go into exile. He was stripped of his boxing license, and he had three and a half years out the ring. Eventually came back, uh, fought a couple fights against Jerry Quarry, Bonavena, and then lost to Frazier. And obviously at the time, Ali was so-called lineal champion, but uh, the difference between Ali and Tyson Fury, for example, is Ali was actually the consensus champion uh, because he'd had several defenses of his title, you know, beating a bunch of top contenders as well as being a lineal at the time. And of course, back then there were fewer belts. Um, in fact, there was some belt confusion while Ali was away from the ring. But he came back, you know, said he was the true champion. Frazier whooped him in their first fight. 
Uh, he went on, had some more fights, and I'm going to pick out some notable ones here. Uh, he fought Ken Norton twice. Many people believe that he didn't win any of the Ken Norton fights. Ken Norton gave him hell, f you know, in, in all three of their fights. We can definitely agree on that. Norton gave him hell, broke his jaw, gave him all types of problems. And he'd already been beaten by Frazier, uh, managed to beat Frazier in a rematch, but still a very tough fight. Then he goes into the George Foreman fight. Well, look what George Foreman had been doing to them same opponents. I mean, Foreman and Ali had several common opponents. So, for example, they both fought George Chavalo, who Ali went the distance with. Uh, they both fought uh, Joe Frazier and Ken Norton, obviously, who Ali went the distance with, apart from in the Thriller in Manila, but that was after um, the Rumble in the Jungle. So, Foreman had wiped out Ken Norton and Joe Frazier in two rounds, guys who'd beaten Muhammad Ali. So, who the hell gave Ali a chance against... George Foreman, very few. But again, boxing is styles make fights. Yeah, Ali, going into the Foreman fight, he wasn't viewed the way he's viewed today as the greatest. It was the Foreman fight that really put his name back up there, you know, because a lot of people had written him off, you know? This is a guy who'd spent years in the wilderness. I mean, Ali's heyday was believed to have been in the 60s. And here we have Ali, in, uh, when was it, 74, when he fought uh, George Foreman? Where are we at? Sorry, well, excuse me, this is Foreman here. Uh, yeah, Foreman here, 74. So by the time it was 74, you know, Ali was seen as a guy really coming to the end. The guy was washed up. If you watch Ali's post-fight interview after the Foreman fight, he talks about how the press said he was washed up, how he can't move no more, how he, he should retire and all this, that, and the other. That's how Ali was seen going into the Foreman fight, and Foreman was like 24, 25, you know, prime of his life, bowling through people who Ali struggled with. Who would have thought that Ali would have not only beat Foreman, but knocked him out? Like, <laughs> that was crazy, the way that unfolded. Then, of course, you know, I've already spoken about Tyson Fury and how early in his career he, he looked less than impressive, to say the least. When you compare his early career to David Price, Price was walking through people. Price wasn't getting dropped by people like Nevin Pikage, going life and death with John McDermott. He was walking through people. And then Tyson Fury vacated his British title rather than defend it against David Price. So it made it look as though Fury was on the run from Price. And maybe he was at the time. Maybe Fury didn't have the confidence in himself and he hadn't developed himself enough of, as a fighter at the time you know, to feel that he could go in there and have a good chance of beating Price. Or maybe it was his, it was his people, you know, his uh, promoter Mick Hennessy, who knows? But obviously Tyson Fury has gone on to be a much, much better fighter than David Price. This is why heavyweight boxing is notoriously unpredictable. Another example, Andy Ruiz. Because you look at Andy Ruiz's record, again, a lot of this was in Boxing Beats and Rams video, but he's got some common opponents with Anthony Joshua. Let's just pick a couple out here. So the first common opponent would be, he's got a common opponent there with Wilder. He went 10 rounds with Lykovic. Wilder knocked him out in I think a round or two. Zambano Love. Okay, so Ruiz fought Zambano in 2015. When did AJ fight Zambano? Also in 2015. Okay, the ninth for the fifth. And this was in the 24th for the 10th. So, Andy Ruiz actually fought Zambano after AJ cleaned out Zambano in two rounds. Andy Ruiz fought Zambano and went the distance. So anybody looking at that would think, oh, well, you know, there's no way that Ruiz could have a chance with AJ. AJ's cleaning out guys in two rounds who are going the distance with Ruiz. Then, of course, they both fought Joseph Parker, both went the distance. Ruiz lost. AJ won. And then Kevin Johnson, and this is a really significant one here, people, because Andy Ruiz went the distance with Kevin Johnson last year. In 2018, he went the distance with Kevin Johnson, whereas AJ destroyed Kevin Johnson in just two rounds back in 2015. So, so AJ is walking through guys like Johnson and Zimbano who are going the distance with Ruiz. 
But boxing, particularly heavyweight boxing, it's not linear. It's chess, it ain't checkers. It doesn't make sense a lot of the time because it is styles make fights. And when you've got these big men throwing heavy lever around, strange things can happen when people get hit on the, on the right spot or the wrong spot, depending on how you want to look at it. So expect the unexpected. That's the message I'm giving you in this video when it comes to heavyweight boxing, particularly in the current heavyweight landscape where we've got a very, very deep division. There's a lot of talent out there. I know there are going to be some people who say, the division's not deep, it's rubbish. No, they're talking rubbish. The division is deep with talent. It's deep with dangerous fighters. Many fighters outside of the top five have got the ability to beat fighters in the top five. It doesn't necessarily mean they will. They've got to get their tactics right. They've got to get their mind right, etc. They've got to take the fights at the right time. But I'm telling you, Several fighters outside of the top five have got the ability to beat the guys inside the top five. And when you have a situation like that, expect the unexpected. I'm going to do a separate video on two fighters who I think may be able to spring big upsets in the heavyweight division. Two, well, one of them is definitely a dark horse. The other guy, not so much of a dark horse because he's a pretty well-known fighter or very well-known really. But the other fighter is more of a dark horse. And because he's a dark horse and because he's kind of flying underneath the radar a little bit, that gives him the potential of scoring more upsets. Because one of the elements that goes into upsets, at least some of the time, not all of the time, but some of the time, is a fighter who's underestimated or a fighter who's being overlooked. He can come in, people don't really realize how good he is, and he can spring an upset. You know, even the fighter that he's facing, the A side doesn't realize how good he is and he can end up losing. So one of these guys I'm going to talk about in the other video is like that. The other one, people are going to see him coming a bit more. Okay, although he's still not proven in a certain sense. I explained that in the other video. But yeah, for this video, this is the meaning of styles make fights, people. Boxing doesn't make sense, particularly heavyweight boxing. It's chess, it ain't checkers. Um, this is why you can't count people out. You know, you have to look at what they do well and say, okay, well, is their opponent used to fighting someone who has these attributes? Sometimes you have to go back to his amateur career to have a, a look at him against someone who has those particular attributes. It's, there's no good just looking at common opponents and saying, oh, well, he's destroyed all the common opponents and this guy has gone a distance with him. Therefore, the guy who destroyed the combat opponents is going to win. No, it's not that simple. It's more complex than that, as I've just demonstrated. So anyway, let me know what you guys feel in the comment section below. Um, this is, of course, a video which most of you have probably seen of Deontay Wilder getting stopped in the amateurs. Some, I believe it was an Eastern European guy stopped him uh, pretty decisively in the amateurs. And... Who at the time would have seen this and thought Deontay Wilder's got what it takes in the pros to become not only the heavyweight champion, but one of the most destructive punches in the history of the sport? How many people would have thought that when they saw Deontay Wilder on the canvas like this, you know, on, the, in a, on them rubbery legs in the amateurs? So yeah, let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. It's happening about. Join me on Patreon. I upload a minimum of two podcasts every single week, covering a wide variety of controversial topics, as well as live stream Q&A sessions. Take a look on screen right now at some of the podcasts I've produced so far. For just $3 a month, the equivalent of about £2 a month, you get access to all my new podcasts and my entire back catalogue of past podcasts, including my popular Confessions of a Nightclub Bouncer series. You can listen on your computer or on your smartphone or tablet by downloading the Patreon app from the Google Play Store or the App Store for free. The Patreon app also allows you to download each podcast in MP3. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, you get access to dozens of hours of exclusive content. It's easy to sign up, there's no contract, and you can cancel at any time. So come and join our community of free and critical thinkers by signing up with me here on Patreon today.